Welcome everyone, welcome friends of Anthony Hyman, friends of SOAS, distinguished guests and visitors, students and colleagues to the 21st annual Anthony Hyman lecture, which was first delivered in 2003. I'm Scott Newton. I have the post in the laws of Central Asia here. I'm the head of the School of Law, Gender and Media, and I'm the chair of the uh, Center for Contemporary Caucasus in Central Asia. Um, I'm here to introduce Shaharzad Akbar, so I'll be brief who will talk to us about repression and resistance, the struggle of women's rights in Afghanistan. The Anthony Hyman Memorial Lecture has become an established annual event at SOAS, now entering its third decade, I'm pleased to announce, bringing together those with an interest in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia, and providing an opportunity for leading scholars, opinion formers, and policymakers to reflect on issues of topical interest. The continuing success success of the Anthony Hyman Memorial Lectures is a testament to the impact which Anthony had on thinking about Afghanistan and the affection in which he was held by his many friends and associates. Anthony, a SOAS graduate, was expert on Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, and Central Asia, and the commentator for the BBC World Service for more than 20 years. Anthony was a linguist, historian, bibliophile, art lover, and traveler. Just to remind you, the lecture series is sustained on the strength of donations as well as a contribution from SOAS. So please do consider making a donation to the Anthony Hyman Memorial Fund to help cover the costs of the lecture in future. The lecture series is equally a labor of love and of fundraising, or perhaps of love made manifest by fundraising, as well as attendance and support. I'm particularly delighted to welcome Shahrazad here tonight. Indeed, she has graced and honored our series and all attending tonight with her presence. She is a particularly notable, versatile, and longstanding human rights activist from Afghanistan, having served as country director of the Open Society Afghanistan and the chair of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, as well as running a Kabul consultancy firm supporting Afghan civil society and advising the former government on development issues, her commentary, journalism, and scholarly analysis is widely published in, in Afghan and international media, including Foreign Affairs, Washington Post, Newsweek, CNN, CNN Al Jazeera, et cetera, as well as academic journals. Shaharzad completed an MPhil at Oxford um, and previously obtained a BA from Smith College in the US. For Reasons acutely felt by all of us here today, Zakharazad is currently in exile. She is a visiting scholar at Wilson College, Oxford, and academy associate with Chatham House. She lives and works in the UK as executive director of, what, of Waradari, a recently established Afghan human rights organization. She has been very extensively involved in human rights advocacy and related media and cultural activities and youth mobilization in Afghanistan and has tirelessly campaigned for accountability and a just peace before Inter Alia, the Security Council and the human, UN Human Rights Council. She is a board member for the International Service for Human Rights and a member of the International Advisory Council for the Institute for Integrated Transitions. A year ago, when we last convened, we were still all reeling from the extraordinary events of the previous summer, which saw a chaotic mass exodus from Afghanistan following the collapse of the Afghan government and the state building project of the West, which undergirded it, and the reascendancy of the Taliban. Although the Afghan crisis remains emphatically that a crisis, it has been displaced from public consciousness and the front pages by the passage of time and the follow on eruption of invasion and war in Europe. But Shahrazad will remind us forcefully tonight that the catastrophe a year and a half ago was no culmination or even any resolution, whatever the conclusions of the retreating interventionists. Afghans remaining at home and those seeking refuge abroad, and Afghan women in particular, have only intensified their struggles for rights and recognition since the Taliban began governing nearly the entirety of Afghan geographic space. The Taliban are far, and perhaps even farther than ever, however, from governing Afghan mental or moral space, space which Shahrazad and her diverse collaborators and allies, 
and supporters and constituencies are continuing courageously and incessantly to contest. Thank you for that really generous introduction and by humbling. And good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for, um, for your interest in Afghanistan and uh, for your continued solidarity. I also want to extend a special thank you to those uh, who are celebrating Nowruz, because I know this is the eve of Nowruz and people want to be with their families. So thank you. Thank you for joining here or virtually. Um, I'm really honored. Um, I'm really honored to be speaking to you this evening and to be part of Anthony Heyman uh, lecture series. Knowing about him and his legacy has been extremely inspiring. And also I'm inspired and humbled because many great speakers came before me in this lecture series. I'm truly also intimidated. Um, tonight, I want to talk about the struggle for women's rights in Afghanistan. You have all heard about Taliban's oppressive policies, about how it has been one bad news after the other, the ban on secondary education, the ban on women working in NGOs, the restrictions on women's movements, all aspects of women's rights and freedoms are being curtailed by the Taliban rule. The situation in Afghanistan has been called a gender apartheid by many activists. Even UN Special Rapporteur for Afghanistan has called the situation tantamount to gender apartheid. We have all heard about all of this, but today I want to talk about the resistance to these oppressive policies, and especially those resisting these policies inside Afghanistan. As early as 17th August 2021, we saw women marching on streets of Kabul, demanding for rights. Since then, they are not on the news so much, but women have continued to resist by marching on the streets, but also adapting other creative ways. They are continuing to educate, they are continuing to learn, they are drawing graffiti at night, they have produced poetry and music, they have held secret classes, they have established libraries, women are advocating locally and internationally for Afghanistan, and they have carried a range of other civic and creative initiatives. Some male activists have also stood up for the rights of women inside Afghanistan through acts of civil dis disobedience. Taliban's response to the civic activism of women and men in Afghanistan has been threats, repression, detention, and torture of activists and protesters, and even detention and torture of their family members. Several of, as I speak now to you, several of Afghan activists, protesters, and journalists are currently in detention with their families unable to connect, to contact them. So who are the women who are resisting Taliban inside the country? They are, the, the, I won't talk about them because they have, they are not only uh, resisting as individuals, but they have managed to, in this difficult, almost 21 um, months, form collectives. These collectives are the most consistent, if not the only, civic resistance to Taliban inside the country. They are continuing to defy Taliban in face of intimidation, arrests, and torture. The women who are part of these collectives are from, come from different parts of Afghanistan. While they are mostly educated, they also mostly struggle with economic hardship in their own lives. They have lost jobs and they operate with very limited resources. They do not have international funding or political support. Most of them do not have a background of activism or even working for the NGOs. And most of them are also new to mobilizing and to addressing the international community as an audience. Despite all this, they have continued undeterred and they have slowly expanded their membership and reach. While the future of these collectives remain very uncertain, particularly with the brutal crackdown by the Taliban, understanding them, paying attention to them and to their demands and, supporting to the, and providing support to them can keep us close to ground in Afghanistan and keep the light on. For me personally, these women on the front lines of resistance to Taliban are the biggest source of hope and motivation. But I also say this fully conscious of my own position of privilege and safety and being mindful of the burden that I and other activists in diaspora might be putting on these women. 
I want to share the stories of two women that I have gotten to know in the past few months as a way of providing a window into women's resistance inside Afghanistan. Hamosa is in her mid forties. She's a mother and a teacher. She lives outside Kabul and she travels to Kabul from her province to join protests, often covered in Chaudhary and often with her son or another male family member. She has also been running a homeschool for girls. Prior to collapse of Kabul, she had never worked for a human rights organization. She doesn't speak English. She also did not previously define herself as an activist. Since she has started participating in these street, street protests, an immediate family member of her, a man, was detained by Taliban to deter her from her work. She continued running her home classes, and she most recently signed an open letter to the international community demanding non-recognition of Taliban and closure of their office in Doha. She was one of the 800 signatories inside Afghanistan who signed this letter that lays out eight demands to the international community. More than 750 of these signatories were women from different parts of Afghanistan, different provinces of Afghanistan. Another activist that I have gotten to know is Parisa. She was an athlete. She was a bodybuilding coach, and then she joined the provincial authority for sports. She got a government job. She wanted to expand opportunities for sport for women in her province. For a while after the Taliban takeover, she held out hope that her life would eventually return to normal because she was still not fired from her job. She would go in once a month, sign her attendance papers, and she would get paid. And she, she thought, you know, eventually Taliban will reduce restrictions. Then she and all her female colleagues were fired and the private gym in the province was closed. It was then that she and a few of her students decided to organize sorry, the protests. They felt they had nothing more left to lose. She as Parisa has been involved in organizing protests only for, for a few months. And despite this, she was arrested by Taliban and held in detention for 48 hours in early February. These two women are among hundreds of women who turned to activism following Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. They were not part of what Denise Candiotti has in an earlier lecture in the series referred to as, as, as donor-driven gender activism. They come mostly from outside Kabul, but also inside Kabul. Most of them have were previously civil servants or teachers, and they have gathered, some of them, some of these collectives have gathered under the umbrella of what they call Afghanistan's Women Protester Movements Coalition. So there were several small groups, but they have come, now come together and formed a coalition. A few of the groups or collectives that are uh, active inside Afghanistan or outside this collection, um, this coalition, but they are also engaged in street protests. These collectives have members in different parts of Afghanistan. They are not just protesting on the streets, as I said before, similar to Hamosa. Some of them run secret classes or schools, and some may have never attended a street protest, but they have support and solidarity with the uh, protesters, and they participate in some other activities, such as secret gatherings to mark occasions, to read poetry, or just to be together in the same space with other women who care and fight for women's rights. They often organize themselves through WhatsApp. They are small in numbers and they are under threat from the Taliban and they are often unknown to or ignored by the international community. These groups are still developing their narrative and strategy as well as defining their relationship to each other and to activists and politicians and diaspora. So what is their narrative? What do they say about themselves? At this stage in developing their narrative, they seem be, to be mostly focused on an Afghan audience. The first thing they want to do is to defy Taliban's narrative about them. What Taliban say about these women protesters or anyone really defying Taliban or standing up to the Taliban is that they are a small group of women who are looking for asylum, that they don't really care about the situation in Afghanistan. So these women really emphasize their gra gra grassroots nature and they talk about that they are not connected to politicians abroad, that they are, this is not a political you know, project of someone outside, that they are organic, that they are sustaining themselves, they are raising funds to print banners 
or to buy internet for each other so that they can stay connected. And they are very aware that their activism might be hijacked for political reasons. So a number of them have actually taken the time to write and publish an op-ed in a woman-run media in exile. And I want to quote from this op-ed what they say about themselves. The young women of Afghanistan across the country started their resistance against the Taliban when cities, NGOs, and institutions were emptied by those claiming to be rights activists, the politicians, and the groups and individuals who politically and financially benefited from the cause of women's rights. As you can imagine, this doesn't make for the easiest relationship between them and those of us in diaspora. <laughs> But overall, the activists in diaspora have been mostly, at least verbally, supportive of the activists on the ground. They refer to the protesters on the ground. They um, try to morally support them and amplify their cause. The demand from activists on the ground for those of us in diaspora is more meaningful support. That you continue to consult with us, they say, that we enable their access to policymakers outside Afghanistan because they believe they should be the ones that are speaking for Afghan women and they should have direct access to policymakers in the West. And they also are in need of financial assistance to buy computers, you know, um, have internet, have banners, the simple things that they need. Although, in a sense, they are very new because most of these protesters weren't the names that we knew, they weren't the prominent faces that we had before the fall of Kabul, we already see an evolution in the way that they are organizing themselves. In the immediate post-August 2021, their demand was the world, should, was the world should do something, international community should do something. So I could, kept asking, what exactly do you want me to tell the policymakers? What should the world do? And they said, but the world should do something. One of them wrote to me saying, if the US wants to do something, they can, they can do something. They have to figure that out, but they have to do something. The situation is not tolerable. But now we see that they are making their demands more specific. So they're asking very specifically about non-recognition of Taliban and steps that the, inter the international community, particularly the UN, but also different countries can take to hold them accountable. So they, they have... So they are slowly evolving. They are realizing that when they are talking to an international audience, as they did through this letter on 8 March, 800 people signed, they, they have realized that, they, that they, the same question keeps coming back to them. What do you want us to do? So they are trying to clarify that, and they are having a lot of internal conversations about that. Who are their audiences? Their audiences are both Afghan and international. Um, because they also produce content, especially they have a Twitter page, this coalition that I was talking about. They have these videos where they're asking Maine to stand in solidarity with them. They're asking other Afghans to stand in solidarity with them. So there's a lot of content and a lot of messaging that's geared towards Afghans themselves. And they also have, of course, have an international um, audience. It has been interesting to see their evolution because initially it was mainly an international audience. But I think there's a little bit of despair sitting in as well, that the world is not coming to the rescue, that we have to, we have to think about other ways of moving forward. It's partly that, it's partly the fact that they are also realizing that Afghans are responding to them. So they're trying to engage the Afghan audience. What's their strategy? What do they want to achieve? So, they, so far, they're really focused on expanding their reach inside Afghanistan and finding new ways to raise their voice while minimizing the risk to themselves and their families. So these are the two main priorities for them. How do we find new members? How do we expand our reach? We are provinces where we don't know any educated women that we can find educated women and get in touch with them. But also, how do we continue to raise our voice without increasing risk for ourselves and our families? So they're doing these video messages with their face covers, fa their faces covered, or um, doing post music, singing songs, Again, you, can, you can't see their face, but you're trying to get a message across or doing open letters, trying to find ways other than going on the street and kind of physically confronting the Taliban. There's also increasingly in their conversations an awareness and recognition that external factors alone can change the situation on the ground. So there's a lot of anger about the fact that the world is indifferent to the plight of Afghan women. But with this anger, there's also recognition that even if the world wanted to do something, that alone is not enough. Uh, they continuously talk about how 
um, how men no, are not standing in solidarity with them, how not enough men are standing in solidarity with them. And one, in one of the conversations, um, one of the protesters was, talking, was saying, you know, we understand that for men, they might think that security risk is higher, that Taliban will directly shoot at them while they may not shoot at a woman. But it's not, it's not the man not attending the protests that's so heartbreaking for us. It's the fact that we, when we are attending the protests, they are making fun of us. The shopkeeper might be fun, making fun of us. Or people refuse to print our banners. Um, or when we are running away from the Taliban and want to hide in a shop, they will not let us in. So it's not that they are not actively standing in solidarity with us and marching on the street with us. They even join the Taliban in mocking us and belittling our efforts. And that shows us that we have a long way to go because we have so much change that we have to work on. And of course, this is also a reflection by them on how much had changed in Afghanistan, but also how much had how much more work needed to be done. Um, so put in the context of Afghanistan's long struggle for gender equality, at least a few decades, if not longer, these collectives follow an existing tradition of activism. And that since they are not new, um, women were doing, you know, women were running secret schools when the first time when Taliban were in power in the 1990s. Afghan women in Pakistan and in the region, Nijan were trying to change the situation inside Afghanistan or continue to educate girls or continue to advocate for Afghanistan in that period as well and before that. But also, there are some things that are new and different about them in the sense that they don't directly come from that, from that sort of an industry that was formed around women's rights in Afghanistan um, in the past 20 years of international um, intervention. And they are not, they are not the activists that were that were really that had really learned and adapted on how to speak to these, how to navigate institutions like the UN, how to speak to a Western audience. This is not that group of activists. This is very different. Um, it's a very different group of activists. They are the product of the constitution and the legal framework that we had that created opportunities for a woman like Parisa to become an athlete. Um, for instance, the expanded access to education, the fact that we had free media in Afghanistan, relatively free media in Afghanistan, and that led to social and cultural transformation where women's aspirations for their lives changed. Across Afghanistan, women were aspiring for lives that were different from their mothers. They weren't all aspiring to become educated or run for parliament or become pilots, but they wanted more. And they felt like they were on this trajectory to getting more, to having more rights. And suddenly this break, with the break and with the collapse came this, then this desire, it didn't change the desire and people felt like they have lost a, traje a trajectory that they were on. Um, and so they are, they are trying to get, in some ways trying, hoping that their activism will bring attention to Afghanistan and, and somehow create more space for them, even, even if they can have some, some of them, for some of them, it's just about having their jobs back. For others, it's about the schools reopening. For others, they want to participate in politics. They still have the ambition to be part of the, you know, part of the government um, and lead. So they have different aspirations and they have different reasons to participate in these street protests or join other activities, but they are all, they all want more and they are all, their demand for more is being met for um, with, with extreme brutality. So these collectives are still new. They are taking shape and they are adapting as they move forward with a view to expansion. What has been impressive uh, for me is to see them do so much with very limited resources, to see them adapt their strategies in light of Taliban's intimidation and do so very quickly and creatively, to see them develop their demands as they move forward and to hear their thoughtful and increased reflection on the limits of external pressure and the limits of international communities' interventions. I do not want to romanticize the civic resistance against the Taliban. Um, there are certainly divides, fragmentations, and still a very limited capacity to mobilize. But I believe if there is a force worth paying attention to in this, in this very difficult situation in Afghanistan, 
It's these small but mighty groups of women uh, who are fighting Taliban's gender apartheid on the front, front line with great risk. And I want to also acknowledge that women, Afghan women in diaspora in the past, um, in the past 20 months have been the most vocal voices on Afghanistan, advocating at every level um, with the UN bodies, with policymakers. Um, you know, some of them started doing this work when they were, their own futures were very uncertain. They had family members inside the country that were facing risks and intimidation. So there is also a struggle outside. And I think at this moment, there is thinking and reflection going on in the diaspora community as well about how to responsibly stand in solidarity with our sisters inside the country, how to better support their work, how to make sure that their voices are amplified. Um, and that, that is a challenge. That's something that we have to figure out. And there is no, as I speak to you, and every waking hour, I am I'm crushed because there's no um, immediate light um, ahead of us. Another school year starts in two days and Afghan girls won't be returning to school um, at the secondary level. But I think when you're in, an, in this very desperate <laughs> and hopeless situation, you, you hang on to what you can. And for me, that has been the activism that's going on inside the country. So robustly with very little resource, very little attention and despite all the brutality. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to open the floor to questions now, and I will take them in batches of three or four. So anyone who, do we have a, a microphone, by the way? Yes, we do have a roving microphone. So please wait for the microphone. So we, and we also have uh, a remote audience as well. Hi, um, what exactly is the Taliban's problem with women? And what do they educate their own relatives, their daughters, or, or they sent to Doha or educated there? We have some. Thank you for a really interesting talk, Sharon. Um, can, can I? Um, you may not know the answer to this um, because you very coherently said that, that these women don't. They have a coalition in Afghanistan, but they don't have a coherent political strategy. Many activists in the West are now saying, actually, the active intervention would be to cut all government aid because so much of it's stolen by the Taliban, make it harder for them to govern, you know, hasten the day when they fracture. I wonder what these women's views are on that, given how much harder life would be if that happened. And then we have, and we'll take these three. Uh... I remember when the Taliban were in power last time around, that they were not a, they were quite hybrid bunch. I mean, they were, they were, it was very different from one part of the country to another, uh, and some were more tolerant than others. Um, and this meant that it was possible for those in power at the local level, I'm not the, the tribal elders mainly, to negotiate with the Taliban based largely on pressure from families. Mm -hmm. and what I'm wondering is to what extent are women able to have an influence on the attitudes of their husbands, parents, fathers, and so on, as has happened in the UK over many, over 100 years. And the, the attitudes have changed enormously at the family level. I just wondered to what extent that's happening in Afghanistan. Okay, we'll stop here and okay. try to that this, this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for those um, very thoughtful questions. And I, I, I may not have to answer to all of them. On on women, on Taliban and women, and and why do, why do they hate women so much. I, I think about that every day. <laughs> I haven't figured it out. It's very clear that they, um, and their very dogmatic understanding of the world and Islam, um, the, the safest place that they see for a woman is being at home. Um, so in conversations with them, they, they would, some of them try to argue that it's for protecting women, that they are um, depriving 
women of their basic rights, that they are basically burying Afghan women alive. Um, and at their attitudes towards their own family members, I mean, it's, it varies. Um, I don't have great detailed knowledge of this, but with some of them, especially those of them who are based in Doha and some of them who have families in Pakistan, we have information that they have um, they have they have their daughters who are studying even at the university level. Um, they have their own daughters going to schools, but of course it's a very different standard when it comes to um, women of Afghanistan and girls of Afghanistan. Again, this own their own attitudes towards women in their family is also not uniform. From it, I understand that there is a level of diversity in this, and some of them who have more exposure and have lived abroad, abro outside Afghanistan for longer. Um, may be more open to women in their own families. Of course, some of them also have taken public positions, um, not, not outright um, disagreeing, but kind of signaling that they would want the schools to open as soon as possible and that they understand that this is particularly on women's edu right to education, to some extent on women's right to work. Um, but, um, but then in action, uh, everything has got continued to got, get worse uh, progressively. In terms of the position on AIDS, I know that even in diaspora, people are divided on how, how to move forward with the question of humanitarian aid and if it's being misused with the Talib, by the Taliban or if it's, um, you know, if it's giving them more leverage, ETC. With women inside Afghanistan, also, there's not a um, uh, kind of one stance on this view. There are varied views. Um, I think they are most, what agitates them the most from my conversations with them is the fact that every interaction with Taliban, the way it's being presented in Afghanistan, is bringing Taliban more legitimacy. In their eyes, even the visits from UN for so high level visits from the UN that happened recently with the intention to reopen school girls or reverse the ban on women work, working, that the way they see that reflecting in Afghan society through Taliban media and through Taliban interactions is sort of bringing more credibility to them. So their main demand really is limit interaction with this group. It's not changing. And the more you sit down with them and take photos with them and kind of entertain them, it's not change. Our life is getting worse. Um, so this is where I have seen a lot of agitation, not so much on the question of aid directly, but more about non-recognition. And there's a very real fear that they will be recognized, that these are somehow steps to getting Taliban recognition. There's a lot of fear, and I think it's a legitimate fear, of Taliban being normalized, because they do, of course, Taliban, of course, would never say that they, what they are doing is a repressive policy that they have made up. They say that it's completely in line with the Afghan culture, it's completely in line with Islam, that majority of Afghans support their decisions. Um, so they, the way Taliban are framing this, Afghan women are, are really scared inside the country that eventually everyone will get tired and kind of lead themselves to believe that this is the case. And that's why they protest as well to say, no, we don't agree with this. This is not who we are. And this whole cultural framing, you know, who is the authentic Afghan woman? Of course, there's a whole lot of trauma and history behind this because, of course, even though these women, these women protesters, they don't speak English, they don't come out of they don't, they are not like me, for instance. I people like me were called unauthentic during the peace, so-called peace process with the between US and Taliban, because when we asked for rights for victims, when we asked for inclusion of women, we were labeled as warmongers, you know, people who are, you are not the real Afghan woman, you guys are educated, you have been to the West ETC. Well, these women, are they authentic? Are you know, where we are the we are the stop, right? As long as a woman is educated, so she then that makes her unauthentic in some sort of framing. So they're also very aware of that trauma and they really want to emphasize their grassroots connections and, and where they come from to say, look, I am the Afghan woman, Taliban don't represent me and please don't normalize them. When, when I talk to them, their main demand is please don't let the foreigners normalize the Taliban and what they're doing in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, yeah, and in terms of the local level negotiations and you know, in, in women's role in that. Some of the women, I talk mainly about women protesters, but there are also women who are defying Taliban, but have adapted a strategy of negotiation. So we are the other space women will try to negotiate because they want to keep their 
activity zoning, you know, so some women have negotiated zoning a tailoring class with the Taliban local authority. It's not that it's a tailoring class, but it's not a tailoring class, right? So women come there to talk to each other, sometimes to read books, to discuss ideas, or to learn literacy. Uh, young girls come there to, to become literate and or follow the school curriculum. So there are there are there is a confrontation strategy, strategy that some women have adapted, some women collectives have adapted because they think that would bring more international attention and that can be helpful. And some have adapted a strategy of negotiation. But what is really scary to me is that the space for negotiation is shrinking. So we we thought that it would be expanding, but what we have seen in the past 19, 20 months is that Taliban, as they as they gain more confidence, they are becoming better and being more centralized. Afghanistan never really had a very strong centralized state, but these guys are becoming better at being more centralized. I'll give the example of my own province. I'm from Jalzjan. And after 15th August 2021, in my province, the secondary schools remained open for girls because that was the local negotiation that kept them open. But now this year, they won't be opening. So instead of getting better, it has gotten worse because it has, they have, now that they have centralized, they have more confidence to carry through with their policies at all level. And there's a lot of talk from, because of these, some people who go out there within the Taliban, but also some, some Afghans who, you know, university teachers, these women, protesters, others who defy Taliban's roles. There has been a lot of talk from Taliban and in increasingly more um, harsher tone about criticizing the government, criticizing people in charge. So a while back, Mullah uh, had a statement where he said, basically, you, you are not allowed to criticize your government. And more recently, Taliban's Minister of Higher Education said that everyone who criticized the government in any way, using a pen, writing about it or talking about it, they are considered bohi and watchable cattle. Basically, they are permis we, are, we are permitted to kill them, which sent a chilling message to everyone, of course, that you say, you know, my electricity is not working, what's this government doing? They might come and kill you. Um, so they have really gone after the soft, um, soft power and soft resistance. Initially, because in Rawadari, in my organization, we track human rights violations. So the first few months, September, October, November 2021, we saw Taliban were merely focused on former security force members, tracking them down and killing them. And they did this in some provinces more than others, but they were doing it across Afghanistan. But then starting December and then January 22, they started going for other groups, for anyone who was criticizing them. At this point, we know that in the Taliban intelligence, there are units and their job is just looking through people's social media pages and going after people who criticize Taliban government on social media. So people have received phone calls or have had visits, or in some cases there have been enforced disappearances. And you know, people have been detained and tortured simply because they have dared to um, resist the Taliban. And for the protesters, I mean, initially there was the sense that because they are women protesting, for cultural reasons, Taliban would not raise their hand on them or take them into custody and keep them away from their families. But not only women have been held in custody, they have been beaten severely while in custody. There are serious and credible allegations of sexual abuse while in custody of Taliban, as well as then the only way they get released is by local elders interfering and negotiating their release. And in that negotiation, the local elders have to sign papers saying these women will not protest again and they will not talk about their experience to media and they will not leave Afghanistan, that they will not leave the country. So they are basically a lifetime, uh, it's life in prison basically, but outside prison for, for, for women. So that's the cost that it comes at and it has made these negotiations, the space for these negotiations, particularly around women's rights, I think is unfortunately shrinking. All right, um, do we have any other questions? Yes. My name is Nadif, I'm a PhD student, but so was very impressive lecture. Um, as an Afghan, I was also uh, observing all the activism of women on the ground. So one thing that really, 
um, keeps coming into my mind is a question that um, we have seen that uh, OIC uh, has um, several times um, attempted to contact Taliban or they made uh, a statement, they sent delegation uh, to talk to the Taliban members, uh, particularly in terms of girls' education. So in terms of the um, women activists in the ground, as you mentioned, and also I have also not, uh, noted that they, uh, beside that they know that how important it is that they have uh, their internal audience, but also they want international community to do anything. Um, I have not come across to know that whether they have thought about to contact OIC members or is is, is a part of like uh, writing mm -hmm. a letter or declaration or has the OIC members been uh, active on that regard? Uh, I've been uh, uh, listening a lot about um, from many Afghans that OIC has been very um, uh, passive in this regard, particularly there was um, a few events that was taken place in the side event of um, of, of the uh, of, 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 of pardon me, uh, exactly the meeting names I forgot, but in Geneva with regards to status of women that in these mm -hmm. night events, um, uh, the uh, the um i was I, I listened from one of the afghan participants that she was in geneva and she told uh the other audience that in these events of oic the issue was like you know islamic uh, law and the role of women but in all of these events there was none uh, no participant or uh, attendee from afghanistan so in such a critical situation like what do you assess uh this and what is your thought on thank you Thank you. So we, we, we have at least as many people online as we do in the room, and they're, they're queuing for questions. So I want to put a okay. few of the questions from the online audience. Okay. Uh, do you see a role for online education provided free by overseas universities in keeping Afghan women, women students mm -hmm. learning, continuing while they are still barred from in-person education? Okay. And how can the international community influence the Taliban's pursuits requiring women regarding women when various UN, US, and European sanctions are seemingly ineffective at changing the Taliban's policies. Okay. Should I? We'll, okay. we'll stop it. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I think that your question and the last question about what can the international community do are uh, connected. So I'll, I'll respond to the online education question, then come to your question. Uh, so there is also a debate about online education, uh, of course, because again, one fear is that. Um, it's important to provide online education. And I really admire and respect the work of um, activists who continue to do so outside Afghanistan. There are other ways also in addition to online. For instance, in Herat, there is a private TV channel that for several hours a day um, broadcasts school curriculum. <laughs> so there's like this teacher teaching school curriculum on TV. And this is one way um, that they want to make sure that the girls have access to education sitting in their homes. And all these efforts are really appreciated by 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 young girls who, who want to continue their education. But there is also this concern that if we focus so much on online education, are we, it shouldn't take up. Basically, as we are trying to provide online education opportunities for women, we should remember that there are so many barriers to access to online education. There is electricity, there is internet. It just, it's a very, very small group of people that can actually use online education many families across Afghanistan don't have electricity. If they have electricity, they don't have internet, they don't have smartphones. If they have smartphones, those are not in the hands of the girls to study, um, to pursue their education. So there are many barriers. Uh, and our focus, while more online education opportunities are very useful, they might be useful for Afghan diaspora, for Afghan refugees in Pakistan and Iran, for instance, in India, uh, there are Afghan women who are studying there. Um, there is a limit to how far that can go. And our focus should be on reopening schools and reopening universities for all Afghan women and girls across Afghanistan. So both things should go at the same time and it shouldn't take away our advocacy and our efforts. That said, I think I, I personally would like to see more free courses, absolutely. More scholarships. I mean, Oxford, the university that I am affiliated to is 
doing nothing at the undergraduate level. Um, they have they have one or two scholarships at the graduate level, but I know capable, uh, um, very capable and committed Afghan women um, inside the country as well as in the region in Pakistan and Iran and India who want to pursue, uh, you know, their uh, BA, their um, um, bachelor's degrees, and they they don't they don't have a way to come to this country, for instance, to study. So more scholarships, I think one way to help Afghan women right now, it, it, it just, I'm amazed that very rich, a very rich university like Oxford, for instance, is not doing more. And uh, certainly other universities can also do more to provide scholarships, but also to make courses available online. Um, courses available online, people will learn the skills. It's a window. It's, of course, probably accessible to a, a, a little, a, a bigger group of people. But of course, people also want their work, their studies to be recognized. They want to have degrees, you know. So. So any, any way that more opportunities could be uh, available for Afghan women is always welcome, more needs to be done. In the meantime, always knowing in the back of our mind that, you know, Taliban might shut down access to internet, that access th that exists is also very, very limited uh, and it's not widespread. So there are a lot of barriers already. Um, in terms of OIC, and then I think related to that is what can the international community do? Um, you raise a very good point. I mean, the OIC is the Organization of Islamic Countries, and there is understandably a lot of expectation from the Afghan woman for this body to do more. There have been some statements, there has been a visit by OIC to Kabul, but, but it hasn't I mean, I think generally the leaders of the Islamic world are failing Afghan women, and that's the sense that some of the women activists that I talked to also share is, but there's not enough pressure. There's a lot of words, but you know, countries that we have a lot of, Afghanistan has a lot of trade with, for instance, in our region, they are not, they are not using any of the leverage that they have, um, or they're not using it enough to push for these issues. When you press some of them, they say, oh, you know, we have a policy of non-interference. Women's education is important, but we don't want to interfere in these, you know, in Afghanistan's domestic affair. It's it's outrageous and it's it's going to catch up with them because I do strongly believe that every day that every day is a loss for Afghan women and girls, but also every day that Afghan women and girls remain out of school, I think, increases the risk of radicalization full radicalization of the Afghan society and people in the region will be impacted by that but that's not their understanding of the situation and in terms of their relationship with the protesters generally diplomats and you know UN even UNAMA with UN uh, UN's assistance mission in Afghanistan and its human rights mandate all of these people try to stay away from Afghan protesters and their excuses that you don't want to put them at risk but I think the fact is that they don't want to, in a way, they don't want to recognize them as a legitimate force, but they are a legitimate force. They are the most legitimate force right now standing against the Taliban, uh, risking their lives. But it's really disappointing that they wouldn't meet, often most of these people wouldn't meet these women, they wouldn't attend them, to, uh, they wouldn't invite them to meetings or in any way try to actively listen to them and to their demands. Um, and part of it may be that women, these women don't know how to navigate, but I think there should be active outreach from diplomats in Kabul, the few that remain, and as well as the UN, but there is actively active dismissal, trying to look the other way and pretend that these women don't exist and are not real, and are not out there risking their lives every day. Um, and that's, it's, it's very strange to me because it shows how much of all of this is politicized because of course we remember and before, before collapse of Kabul, uh, you know, all of these diplomats and embassies would try to go out of their way to speak to women in different provinces, to hear women activists demands ETC, and sometimes justify their own pressure on the government kind of referencing the work of women or activism of women or demands of women, but right now they are completely looking the other way, um, which is really heartbreaking and difficult to watch. Um, in terms of what can the world do apart from sanctions, you know, there's already a lot of pressure being exerted on the Taliban. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult because I think that the, when you want to, when you ask what what can the world do, what can international community do, you have this assumption that there is some political will to do something. 
I genuinely believe that at least in the US and I think also in many European countries, there is not much political will to do something about Afghanistan. And it's really hard to say this and say this out loud, but I do think the Biden administration, for instance, they really want Afghanistan to be forgotten. The best scenario for them is Afghanistan being out of news. Afghanistan is a failure, an embarrassing failure that they do not want to think about. They don't want to remember. They just want it out of the news. They want to send some money for humanitarian aid and be done with it and don't think about it again. And that is the reality that activists have to face every day in our advocacy, because we are talking with people who don't have a lot of power in their administrations. They don't have a lot of, you know, they have a title. They don't have a lot of um, power. They are not being heard. They don't have a lot of resources. They are given a very strict counterterrorism priority, list of priorities to work with. Human rights is nowhere there, despite what they say publicly. So when we talk to them, when we ask them for things, they can't do much. They don't have the resources, they don't have the support, and there is no political will and interest in those countries. Um, and so I think Afghanistan's crisis for many people is already forgotten. Um, but the women, the girls who can't go to school every day, they, they have no way of forgetting about that, right? Um, so I think, you know, there are, if there is political will, there are things that can be done. For instance, Taliban, some Taliban leaders have businesses, um, investments in Qatar and Pakistan. Um, US, for instance, has close relationships to both these countries. But I think there, is, there isn't such political will to push harder. And when we ask to push harder, they say, oh, it will backfire. It will make things worse. How much worse can it get for women? How much worse can it get? You, you are not allowed to go to school. I, you know, they live with this every day. So. Yeah, so it's, um, if there is political will, I think there are things to do to hold Taliban to account. I mean, we were talking about the International Criminal Court the other day. There's an arrest warrant out for Putin. Great. You know when the investigation on Afghanistan started? 2007. You know who is a member of the Trump statue? Afghanistan. Who is not a member of the Trump statue? Russia, also Ukraine. No arrest warrants have been issued in case of Afghanistan. So I think that's the kind of reality when we talk about international community. Often the question is which international community and where is the political will in the international community? Yes, in the back row. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> um, this kind of goes back to the first question on aid. Um, and just to say that there is even more of a struggle now in Afghanistan to deliver aid because so many NGOs are restricted and they don't have access to female staff. And so they can no longer provide aid to women and girls. Um, and I was just wondering, do you think that there is a role for, IN, for international NGOs and national NGOs to support women and girls in Afghanistan and make spaces for the kind of groups that you were talking about today, given all the restrictions that add the scrutiny that is being placed on yeah. those NGOs at the moment? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. As you said, delivery of it. Oh, sorry. We, we, just a couple more we questions. Have more questions. From from the online crowd. Um, right. Structural violence against women and girls is nothing new. There has been a war for 40 plus years. The Taliban have brought it to an end. How do Afghan women, women and their families relate to the fact that the Taliban have brought an end to the war that greatly restricted their lives? And then um, a question about sport here. Sports isolation played a part in bringing down apartheid. Prior to the return of the Taliban, Afghanistan started to make a name in international sport, particularly cricket. Australia recently canceled a series against the men's team because women were being banned from playing. Sport may be one of the less important issues, but should the sports community now exclude the Afghan teams, or is it better to keep the players in the country in the public eye as our gaze focuses elsewhere? Mm. That's a controversial question. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So on the question of aid, you're absolutely right that the work of aid um, 
the work of delivering aid. This is not something that we directly monitor in our work, but we know even by anecdotal um, kind of experience being shared with us that it's it's being greatly affected by the recent bans um, in a country like Afghanistan. If women are not delivering aid, and there are many female headed households due to the long conflict. Um, women would simply not come out and uh, it's harder for them to access humanitarian aid. It's it's a disservice. I mean, Taliban, it's so brutal. Taliban made this decision to ban women from working for NGOs in the middle of a very harsh winter um, in a country where millions are going starving. Uh, it's added to, to the misery of Afghans, women, men, children across the country. And the response to it, I mean, some organizations, some of you have followed this, some organizations decided to suspend their operations because they said, practically, we can't carry out our operations without 40% of our staff who are female. How are we supposed to, to do that? And what's next step? Are you going to come and tell us to replace our female staff with men? I mean, where, where, where will this stop? Um, and there has been a lot of commentary also on the response, that the fact that there wasn't a cohesive response because some organizations felt that their life-saving work has to go on no matter what, so they continue to adapt and continue their work. And some organizations felt like they can't as a matter of principle, but also practicality. I will not go into all of that discussion, but I think in terms of what international INGOs can do is to really be better allies for Afghan NGOs because one or one group of organizations that were affected by this ban were of course Afghan NGOs that were women-led or had women working for them. And these NGOs don't have the same access to Taliban officials as international NGOs do. And they are not in the rooms, often they are not in the rooms where these discussions happen. Of course, Akbar is a kind of this, this umbrella that brings together organizations, international and Afghan organizations in the humanitarian space. But um but some of them are not in the same rooms and they don't have the same leverage. They don't have big operations. They are not, you know, they are not Red Cross. They are not NRC. They are, they are small organizations that often operate in one or two provinces, but they're also being impacted by the ban. So I think my, my, my hope, my wish, my aspiration, my recommendation is that they need to be protected. They need to be supported and kind of trying to minimize the impact of the work the, the ban on them. Uh, for the donors, this means that they continue to pay these organizations, um, they continue to support these organizations so that they can keep their female staff on a payroll, even if they can't go out there and carry out their duties right now because of the ban. And for the international organization, this means that they continue to consult their Afghan pairs and make sure that the advocacy that's being done is, or the negotiations that are being done, because they're also conducting negotiations for Tal with Taliban in some places, they have gotten exemptions for some sectors, that these negotiations include the voices and demands of Afghan organizations as well, because they have less access um, at the national level to government authorities, and they have less leverage to, uh, to negotiate for resuming their work in any shape or form. In terms of in the war and how that's impacting Afghans, Afghan men and women, of course, and, and questions of structural violence. Yes, Afghanistan has been in war for a very long time and everyone, all of us were really looking forward to an end to war. And I think Afghan women were, were realistic that there might be compromises. Um, you know, there were discussions in, 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 in women's groups, among women's NGOs, we could, based on Taliban's promises in Doha and statements, people were thinking, okay, you know, our workplace might be segregated, but maybe that's a price that I'll pay for an end to war. My workplace will be segregated, but I'll continue to be able to work. And people were talking about these things. Am I ready? Am I not ready? How do I feel about this? What does this mean for women's movement? What does it mean for the gains that we have made? And I think we all knew and feared that Taliban had not changed, but we were constantly being told by everyone, you know, by the international community, by the Taliban themselves, that they have changed. And now there will be this era of this end to violence. And but the end to violence, there will be a return to normalization, that girls will go to school, women will continue to work. There might be some limitations, but it will not be a full erasure of women and society. So for me, the war hasn't ended. It's a war against women in Afghanistan right now. The war hasn't ended for women because 
they are told that they cannot exist. It's not, it's not something small, you know, <laughs> they, they can't go to school. It's as basic as that. Every day war was taking lives away from us every day. Imagine a country five years, six years, 10 years from now, where you don't have new female nurses, new female doctors. That's gonna cost them lives. That's costing lives right now, the fact that girls are not being educated, that women are not working. It's cost to our economy is causing, um, causing lives. If people were dying in violence, now people are dying of hunger. So how has the war ended? Yes, the act of violence has stopped, but the, the seeds of other conflicts, unfortunately, are being planted if the situation continues. Because today I'm here talking about the women's rights and the impact of restrictions on women, how women are resisting the Taliban. But, but my work, the work that we do in our organization, we are looking at enforced disappearances. We are looking at collective punishment. We are looking at illegal detention. We are looking at torture. We are looking at all these things that Taliban are doing, these acts of sexual acts of violence that Taliban are committing against women, against minorities, against anyone who dares to defy them. And how will this end for Afghanistan? That's what I worry about every day. I'm again, I think the biggest thing for Afghan is to for Afghanistan is to break the cycle of conflict, but we cannot break the cycle of conflict by erasing women from the public space. We are prolonging the conflict. That's what I believe. In terms of sports and the question of sports, this became very controversial because when the Afghan cricket team, which I'm a fan of, was, um, was banned um, from participating in, in competition in Australia on account of Taliban's policies, there, were a, a, there was a range of responses to that. I can only share my, I, I'm not representing anyone, I can only share my personal opinion. I, I thought that was the right step for Australia. And I thought this shouldn't be, I think the situation in Afghanistan should not be normalized. You know, every few days, weeks, we need a reminder that this is not a normal situation. This is not okay. And if we go with business as usual, then slowly it will become normal. And so for me, any steps that we can take to remind everyone about the gra gravity of the situation and the need to do something about it, I think, you know, it's important. And it sends a message to women and girls in Afghanistan that you are not being held hostage and being collectively punished for your gender while the world is just looking away. There are people who care. Well, if, if Shakhrizat will indulge us, we will take a, a final round of questions. Yes. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, talk. I was just going, I wanted to ask about the, um, to what extent uh, women activists uh, from Afghanistan uh, are also forging links with um, activist women's movements in uh, neighboring regions? Because we've heard a lot about uh, women in the West, but I was wondering about yeah in Pakistan or in Iran or <clears throat> in Central Asia and um, the ways in which those connections could be used to um, influence or um, exert pressure upon uh, regional governments. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, one of the things that um, is really concerning me personally is, okay, so let's say there is a good scenario in which schools open, but no one is talking about what is taught at schools because we have Taliban in power. And, you know, one of, like, if you look at the ministers, I think Minister of Education, Minister of Higher Education are among the most ide ideologized ministers in the Taliban, right? So, um, don't you think that the school will be used as institutions to indoctrinate, like mass indoctrination across the country, um, teachers who are being vetted by the Taliban, who are being hired by the Taliban to just preach whatever the, the Taliban believe about the society, about human rights, about whatever? And then one, one last question online. 
Uh, is there any prospect of relying on Islamic teaching and experience from other countries to argue that the Taliban policy on women is against Islam? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. In terms of regional questions, uh, connections, I think um, not all of us, but most of us were very Western. This includes me. We were very Western focused um, in the past 20 years, over 20 years in Afghanistan, because um, we we were, you know, mo ma well, the whole country was funded by the by the, our national budget was funded internationally, but also our, many of our counterparts um, were Westerns, and we felt like we have a Western audience. And that was really one of the, the flaws, I think, and one of the serious flaws in the work that we did, that we didn't pay as, as much attention and we didn't spend as much time and resources in cultivating regional relationships. Some of us did. I think some of the older activists who had a longer history of engaging um, on women's rights um, did, but most of us didn't. Um, and now for people, for activists inside of Hanson, it's very difficult because of language, because they can't travel, etc. For diaspora, I think um, a lot of us are now starting to look into that because finally people are settled or they have their papers where they can travel, etc. Because uh, they were dealing with a lot of these logistics of being a refugee now, which is the reality for most of us. Uh, so, but I, it's good to see that there's more recognition of the fact that we need to work uh, with actors in the region, both diplomats and governments, but also women's rights groups, civil society, you know, different collectives that exist in the region that are that have a, a shared vision and goal and kind of start to establish. But I would say it's not, it's a very in a very early stages from what I understand right now, but that recognition has has happened. And diaspora has, that's one of the ways that diaspora can be useful towards activists in Afghanistan is so, sort of also building that connection and helping their messages uh, being heard. In terms of education, yes, I, I worry every day about indoctrination. Uh, you know, in my province, um, many new madrasas have, uh, have opened um, since Taliban took over. And because people are desperately poor, they are sending their children to these madrasas. That's the only education available um, for them. Sometimes they provide some, the madrasas provide some support, small support to families in terms of food assistance, etc. And yes, I believe that Taliban have uh, a, a vision for, for indoctrination and radicalization of Afghan society. I think some Taliban might be thinking, you know, some of they know that some of their policies are extremely unpopular right now, and they want to make them popular in a few years from now. You know, they want, they, I don't think they want to, some of them might think, you know, in five years, 10 years, if this lasts, and if we have to go for an election just as a show, you know, of will, will we be supported by people? And they are very intentionally working at radicalizing Afghan society. So you yes, asked to all of those questions and why, why, worries and fears that you have. But I think focusing on reopening of school, it's about, it's not just about schools, right? It's about the fundamental right to education, that girls have a right to formal education. It's the state's duty to provide formal education to girls as well as boys, that it has to be open. The girls deserve to be educated as much as the boys deserve to be educated, they need the same resources. And of course, questions of curriculum, I know that even very soon after August um, 21, when there was the discussions of um, support to education in inside Afghanistan by some donors, there were discussions around curriculum and kind of conditionality around the fact that the curriculum should remain unchanged. So all of that is also, unfortunately, all those discussions are now Muse because the schools are closed, but it is something that I think policymakers are thinking about, activists are thinking about actively, and this whole focus on schools, girls' schools doesn't mean once the girls' schools are open to girls all as well, and you know we can all go and take a break and drink tea. It's really about the fact that it's a fundamental human right recognized in all Islamic countries, all countries on this planet except Afghanistan, and reversing that injustice. Um, in terms of Islamic teaching and principles, you know, even during the peace process, sometimes people told us, uh, you know, if you if you adapt a more religious tone to your, I was leading the Afghanistan on Independent Human Rights Commission at the time, they said, if you adapt a more religious tone to your statements, etc., 
wouldn't it make your relationship with Taliban easier? And we, we had a lot of internal, we didn't, we didn't deal, like we didn't dismiss this lightly. We, we had a lot of internal conversations. But as Afghans, I think we know that Taliban are really not about representing Islam as most Afghans understand it. You know, they they don't, it's not because it's not because their audience hasn't argued with them from an Islamic perspective that they are doing the things that they are doing. There's, of course, always value. I, I, I think it's important to continue to the dialogue. It's, it's very important that religious scholars inside Afghanistan are calling for the opening of schools. I think there should be more of that. I think there should be stronger alliances between the religious community, the private sector, and the activists, because I don't think the activists on their own can do anything, really. We need, we need the private sector to stand with us. We need the religious community to stand with us. But it's also very important that Taliban are not banning girls from school because they don't know they don't know this is wrong in Islam. They know what Islam says about education. They know that full well. It's not because it's not about that. And when you talk to Taliban about Islam and you know culture and all of these things, they always find a way of justifying their own policies. I mean, they are aware they're being told daily that no Islamic country and Erdogan and others in the Islamic world have said in very harsh terms that Taliban's policies are completely un-Islamic when it comes to women's education and work, and they still continue operating on that basis. Right, on, on that note, I'm going to propose that we move from the formal to the informal part of the evening and adjourn for a reception in the foyer. But before I do that, I want you to join me in thanking Sakharazad for what was really an extraordinary, riveting, and humbling, and sobering, and unflinching account um, that was at the same time a, a testimony to um, the, the extraordinary resilience and ingenuity and indomitability and smooth steadfastness, to use the Palestinian term, um, of Afghan women. Thank you so much. Thank you all.